At Baptist Health South Florida, it's our mission to care for you when you're injured or sick and help you stay healthy and fit. Welcome to the Baptist Health Talk podcast, where our respected experts bring you timely, practical health and wellness information to improve your family's quality of life. Is it a headache or a migraine? And what can be done to battle the debilitating symptoms? On this episode of Baptist Health Talk. Hello, Baptist Health Talk podcast listeners. I'm your host, Dr. Jonathan Fialco. I'm a practicing preventive cardiologist and lipidologist at the Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute at Baptist Health South Florida, as well as Chief Population Health Officer at Baptist Health. When we think about public health issues that have serious social and economic consequences, the first thing that comes to mind probably isn't migraine headaches. Diseases like COVID-19, cancer, heart disease get the most headlines. But when you look at the numbers, migraine is the third most prevalent illness in the world. It's estimated that in the U.S., more than 157 million workdays are lost each year by migraines. Headaches in general are suffered about one-third of our population in various surveys, and migraines in particular are suffered by about one out of 10 Americans. And 55% of headache sufferers have missed school or work over three-month periods. What do we know about migraines? What's the latest information on treating this debilitating disease? To help us learn more about migraines, as well as how one can differentiate between a migraine and other common cause of headaches, is Dr. Brad Herskowitz. Dr. Herskowitz is a neurologist with the Miami Neuroscience Institute, which is part of Baptist Health. Welcome to the podcast, Brad. Uh, Thank you very much, John, for having me. Uh, It's an honor to be here. Great. Um, I think we're going to have a really a good program here, a lot of information that I think that you'll be able to provide. Um, and let's start by just talking about headaches in general. Um, you know, everyone has experienced headaches. We kind of know what it feels like. But can you talk about the more common causes of headaches that we see in populations? And then we can get more into migraines in specific. Sure. So there are the headaches are uh, categorized into primary and secondary headaches. Disorders. So the primary headache disorders, uh, the most common being migraine, uh, tension headaches are very common, uh, headaches related to the neck uh, or cervicogenic headaches, sinus headaches, um, and just the garden variety headaches that people get. So um, there's those type of headaches, and then there's other headaches that we worry about, headaches associated with more serious things like brain tumors and other things. But we'll stick to the primary headache disorders, uh, most common being migraine and tension type headache. So we do see a lot of people have headaches. They say, oh, I'm having a migraine. It might not be a high migraine. Let's talk now specifically about migraines. What, what are the signs and symptoms that one may have or feel that would make you say, yes, this sounds like a migraine headache? And this is a important distinction when I see patients in the office. They may come in and say, uh, I have migraines and then, or, that, you know, or headaches, and, and you have to, to categorize their headaches and try to find out, are they migraines or not? And migraines have a certain uh, classification criteria. And the headaches, uh, the classic headaches for migraines are usually one-sided or unilateral, throbbing or pounding. And then there are associated features, um, which are nausea and or vomiting, uh, light and noise sensitivity, uh, sometimes smell sensitivity. Um, So these are the, the classic features that would categorize someone's headache as a migraine. So how would you contrast that? Uh, uh, hear what you're saying and, 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 and well stated. Um, what would be kind of headaches that would make you say it's not a migraine? What are the kind of symptoms that someone would feel that would make you feel clear? Tension, headache, which is very common, right. sinus so headaches. A headache is sort of is a headache that is more of a, like a band constricting the head. It's, it's fairly constant, uh, pressure-like uh, versus the migraine, which is throbbing. Uh, the migraine is often more debilitating. Uh, often worse when you exert yourself in any way, and a migraine patient may have to lie in a dark room. A tension headache is more of a dull, kind of their headache at the end of the day, um, you know, not terribly bothersome. Can You can kind of go about your activity. Um, you know, sinus headaches also are, a lot of people confuse sinus headaches with migraines, and I find patients who think they have sinus headaches actually have migraines. So, so you know, it's important to, to that distinction is important uh, to decipher in patients. So, so you mentioned that the migraine headaches um, um, can be more severe than other kinds of headaches. When the headache goes away, does the person then feel well? Uh, aren't there circumstances where there's a more debilitating aspect to a migraine? Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yes. Well, migraines uh, can often have uh, an aura prior to the headache where they feel the headache coming on, uh, whether it's a visual symptom, whether it's a, a flashes of lights or zigzag lines, followed by a headache, which can last for hours to days. 
And then often what we call the post drone, which is after the headache is over, there's a sort of hangover effect or feeling. Uh, the brain is, is often heavy and sloshy. They just don't feel normal. And that's a common a symptom of migrant ores. So we could definitely see why this can really impact one's quality of life and, and, and being able to go to work and various other uh, uh, secondary components of uh, yeah. having a migraine. Absolutely. You know, the unpredictability uh, of migraines as well affects patients. And I fill out a lot of FMLA forms um, for patients with migraines at the workplace because they often have to miss time, you know, and they worry about uh, keeping their jobs. So, you know, there's so many features other than just headaches alone. Do you, um, do you, do you diagnose migraine basically on, on you, an expert, getting a good history of the symptoms? Are there any tests or anything that say, aha, it's a migraine? Mm -hmm. uh, it's based on clinical criteria, the, the patient's symptoms. Um, if they fit the criteria that I discussed earlier, which is the throbbing, pounding, one-sided headache, nausea, light noise sensitivity, uh, that's pretty much a migraine. That, that's enough for me. Um, I think that any patient who has migraines or headaches who's never had a brain imaging study, such as an MRI of the head, should have one at least once in their lifetime just to make sure there's nothing else. But there is no imaging study that tells me this is a migraine. So it's more when you prove it's not other things and it meets the criteria for the symptoms, which uh, makes sense. Uh, how about uh, who's um, at risk for uh, migraines? Um, are there age groups where it generally starts? Um, uh, it's more likely to start. Are there other components? Um, uh, is it gender related? Or, uh... So in society, we find that uh, women are three times more affected than men. I think about 18 percent of the United States females have uh, migraine headaches. Uh, so um, and the age group is generally young, 18 to maybe the 40s. Uh, so it's kind of that age group, more common in females than males, which is uh, representative of my practice. And that's what I see. Um, there, you are more likely to have a migraine if you have a family member uh, with a migraine. So, so there is some uh, genetic preponderance. Um, however, we don't really, that doesn't come into to clinical practice very much. I don't think about it. I usually ask, but it doesn't necessarily make a difference in how we're going to treat them. We don't get to genetic testing. Uh, maybe sometime in the future, this will be clinically relevant, but at this point, it's not. Um, what about causes of migraines? Can you speak to, again, what we know scientifically uh, or don't know? Um, and then are there other things that happen to a person, triggers that might bring on a migraine? Yeah, so we don't know why people get migraines. Again, we think there's this genetic component um, to it. Um, but, you know, a lot of patients do not have a family history. Uh, things that um, can cause migraines in patients, I would say most patients probably don't have triggers. Uh, even though we look for them, uh, they don't have them. However, uh, patients that do have uh, triggers, um, and that's something that I do in my office. Every patient who comes in with migraines, they get a headache calendar to record their headaches, the frequency of them, the severity, the duration of them. Then we give them a food trigger list. And I discuss with them, you know, to look at these different foods. So, so common triggers um, are, would be stress, would be uh, not sleeping well, um, not drinking enough fluid, maybe not staying hydrated. And then foods like red wine, uh, certain cheeses, nuts, uh, excessive caffeine, uh, things like that are, are common triggers that, that patients find that they that may, um, may be causing their headaches. And it's important because if you limit the triggers, you limit the frequency of headaches. So, so you have had in your clinical experience when you work with the individual and find out things that for them may trigger it, if they remove or improve that component, you've seen improvement in their migraine. Uh, Absolutely. Frequency. Yes. That's, that, that's good to know. So one of the treatments as we start talking about options would be lifestyle modification or, or um, again, if you're identifying a food trigger, avoiding those types of things. Correct, yeah. So so you, you've been very um, um, uh, articulate in elucidating the kind of symptoms that would separate other kinds of headaches from a migraine and who's at risk. Um, when should someone say, it's not just a migraine, you know, I could take a, a medicine, uh, an over-the-counter medicine, when should I seek medical attention? Right. Well, that's something that, that I deal with in practice frequently, and any neurologist does, is, is this a, a worrisome headache? Is this a migraine? Is this something more concerning? Should I get an imaging study? And I think any patient with chronic headaches or chronic migraines whose headache is different, uh, the characteristic is different, um, uh, the features are different. This is, this is not a migraine. 
then I would say um, that patient needs to be imaged. If it's the, we call it the worst headache of their life, a thunderclap headache, if they have fever, uh, if they have weakness or visual disturbance, anything like that that's not of the norm, uh, this patient should have an imaging study of the brain. Do you find most people self-refer or they're referred by a family member? Um, that's a good, you know, I don't, I think there is a component to self-referral and I think that um, the simple migraine patient will be treated by their internist or primary care physician when it gets perhaps more complicated or uh, the doctor's uncomfortable, they will refer to a neurologist. So, you know, I think it's both. I think it's referral from workplace, from friends, family, and, and doctors equally. Good, good. Um, you mentioned, uh, we mentioned um, um, some of the uh, lifestyle modifications. Take us through a little bit. What else would you recommend to someone? What are the treatments that are available that uh, you found have a, uh, an impact and, and scientific studies show this benefit? Right. Uh, so as far as lifestyle modifications, um, I think it's important to get uh, regular sleep. I think exercise is important. Eating well, finding um, triggers or avoiding things that may cause your headaches, uh, relaxation. Uh, there are uh, there are a new class of medications um, that are available and, and um, new scientific data on the etiology or cause of migraines, which I think has impacted uh, positively um, the treatment for migraines. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about treatment, if you don't mind. Please, absolutely. Okay. So uh, in general, um, there are two ways to treat migraines. Uh, one is the acute treatment. So when you get a headache, you take a medication, and then there's a preventative uh, medications to take to prevent the frequency and severity. Um, so as far as the acute treatment of migraines, um, there's this simple over-the-counter stuff that people try that may work for them, Excedrin, Fioracet. Um, Tylenol, Advil, Advil migraine, those things. And if that works for you, great. Um, but a lot of migraineurs, it's, it does, it's not effective. Um, there are two new medications, and I, and I talk, speak about the, this new class of migraine medications called the CGRP antagonists, um, which stands for calcitonin gene-related peptide. And that is a peptide that has been found that is released by uh, these nerves called the trigeminal nerves uh, in, the, in and around the brain that um, cause inflammation and they cause dilation of the blood vessels in the brain, which cause the pounding, throbbing headache. And the science, scientists have shown that if you um, affect the CGRP or limit the um, activity of the CGRP molecule, that that will limit migraines. We found that in both acute treatments with two new medications called Ubrelvi and Nurtec. Uh, and those are taken at the onset of the headache and what they do is they antagonize uh, the CGRP molecule and, and or receptor, not allowing the, the CGRP to cause this vasodilation or, or dilation of blood vessels or the inflammation we see, uh, thereby limiting the severity of the migraines and the duration. So those two have been very effective. And when you talk about the prevention of migraines, and the, the, the patients who require prevention are the ones that have a, a significant frequency, more than you know two a week. Those medications, there's kind of old school stuff that, that you know about, John, like the beta blockers and calcium channel blockers. Uh, I, you know, I don't, that's not my first line, but those are something that can be effective. Antidepressants can be effective. There's a drug called Topiramate or Topamax, which is uh, an anti-epileptic, but also FDA approved for migraines, which is, can be very effective. But this new class of, of preventative inject CGRP injections, uh, there's three of them on the market called Amivig, Ajovi, and Mgality. And they are injections that um, people inject every 28 days themselves into the skin. And they have been very effective for patients with episodic migraines less than 15 days per month. Also, um, not to be too long-winded, but Botox injections are FDA approved for migraine headaches as well. I happen to be an expert injector for Botox and for the company Allergan. Um, and for patients with chronic migraines, meaning headaches, more migraines more than 15 days per month, meet criteria for Botox injections. And these have been unbelievably effective in a certain population of the chronic migraine or 15 or 20 headaches to none uh, per month which is remarkable. So um, that these are the different options that uh, patients can discuss with their neurologist 
uh, both the acute treatments uh, and the, uh, um, the preventative medications for migraine. So it's, it's fascinating and um, encouraging to know we have lots of weapons for the migraine sufferer to improve their quality of life and eliminate the migraines, as you said, from simple solutions to more complex. Um, as you evaluate the patient, I would presume you do a detailed and individualized approach towards what steps you would take to get them under control. Correct. Can you, can you, can, is, it, mm-hmm. is it varying which medication I think is best or when would you go to Botox? Is that how you mm-hmm. kind of approach the, yeah, uh, the well, I, you know, do you do like, like any doctor, you do a history and a physical, you determine the, the, how bad are the headaches, how frequent are they, what have you tried, what do you want to try? And basically I tell my migraine patients, um, it, it's trial and error. You know, I'm here for you. You follow up regularly. If A doesn't work, we go to B. Uh, there are a lot of different options. You know, I think with any um, any patient you have, you know, you just want to give them hope. You want to provide them with, you know, your support um, that I will help you. We will we will get through this. We'll find a medication that helps you. You know, they just need to you know, follow up regularly. And we try different things, whether it's acute treatments, prevention, different types of stuff, um, whatever it is that, that requires uh, follow up on the patient's part and my part. Right. Um, so um, let, let's bring it to a, a couple of quick things um, that you mentioned. Again, I, I really appreciate um, informing our listeners and, and me regarding what these, these advanced treatment options. But you mentioned early on, and again, just for the listener's standpoint, um, and, and again, I'm going to preface it by saying, obviously, it's individualized, but alcohol, wine yeah. can trigger, um, you mentioned. Sure. Um, wine, red wine is a trigger in, in some patients. Right. How about <laughs> caffeine, good or bad? Caffeine, you know, anything in moderation is okay. And, you know, if you have patients who are drinking four, five, six cups of coffee or cafecitos, uh, then, you know, that can, you know, you want to limit the caffeine. And then you can get caffeine withdrawal headaches as well, especially on weekends because they drink, wake up early, drink coffee during the week. Weekends, they sleep late, they get caffeine withdrawal. So anything in moderation. That's actually it's a great point, I think, for the listeners, because it's something we all do see in clinical practice that during the week, people drink caffeine and on the weekend. They might have headaches, a little stomach upset, a little restlessness, and actually just withdrawing from the caffeine they have during the week, which is right. a mild withdrawal, but it's it's yeah. real. Yeah. Um, how about screen time? Is there any relationship to looking at uh, phones or computers now that can trigger migraines or be related to uh, specific migraines? Yeah, particular- I think you need to individualize each patient. Uh, some and I'd probably say a small percentage of patients have difficulties at home or at the workplace due to screen time and you have to, you know, make efforts you know, via, you know, the FMLA form to, to limit screen time, more breaks. Um, sometimes a certain lighting people don't like at the workplace. So the, um, so each patient is individualized. And again, you try and find out what triggers their headaches and, and have the best you can do to limit those. So uh, again, great information. It's, it's wonderful to have you as a resource um, in, in our, in our community and in, in, in Baptist health. Um, Last question I have, which again, we touched on, and then I'll, I'll, I'll certainly turn over to you if there's any, any points that you want to bring up that we missed. Um, we did mention tension headaches, big cause of headaches. We talked about stress, can trigger migraine. So if you can talk, you mentioned early on what the symptoms of the migraine are, the throbbing, the one-sided, the aura. Um, let's just talk about tension headaches for a little bit because they are so common yes. and people do tend to attribute. So when you're evaluating a patient, what would make you say, ah, this sounds like a muscle tension headache as opposed to a migraine? Right. So the, the tension headaches are uh, completely different than migraines. They are more sort of a, if you have a headband on, it's almost like the squeezing of the head. Um, it, it's not a throbbing, pounding type of headache, but it's more of a constant, dull type headache, um, less severe. Uh, you have generally do not have associated features. Um, and these are often towards the end of the day, someone has a stressful day. I think we've all gotten those tension type headaches, um, you know, so um, there are different headaches and sometimes hard to treat. Uh, there's no class, you know, there's no he- uh, medication for just a tension headache. Um, yeah, the tension headaches, um, uh, let me put it a different way. Sometimes the tension headaches, you can have soreness of your neck muscles, soreness sure. of the temporal muscles. With migraines, you would not have any particular points of your head or your neck that would be sore. Well, you can actually. Head. And uh, in, in the treatment injection paradigm, when we do Botox injections, the part of the injections are in the neck. Yeah. So in the trapezoid and the paraspinal is just uh, in the neck. So, so uh, there may be a component. I mean, I think everyone's different. Some people have uh, some neck pain, some don't. Um, so I, I think you have to individualize it. 
Great. So again, I appreciate this information. Headaches, as we said at the beginning, are very common. We don't want to scare people with relatively um, infrequent, you know, tension headaches. But there does come a point where you do want to get checked out by your doctor and certainly uh, a headache uh, migraine expert uh, neurologist um, like yourself, like we um, we brought up. Um, any final comments you'd like to make, or anything you want to uh, reiterate that we uh, that we uh, that we mentioned? Well, I mean, I think one last topic I would address would be medication overuse headaches, or uh, we call them a transformed migraine. And this is uh, very common in patients, uh, migraineurs who are undertreated or not well, uh, treat, not treated sufficiently, um, can take a lot of over-the-counter medications, whether it's Excedrin migraine, Advil, Fiorset, and they actually cause more headaches by a withdrawal effect. And we find that a certain percentage of patients who come to the office have this almost chronic daily migraine, where they have a regular migraine that is transformed into this type of chronic headache, and it's because of too much medication and withdrawal of this medication on a regular basis. And so that's something that um, is also difficult to, to treat, and you have to treat that along with the migraine. So I would say, tell anybody out there listening, if you're taking an excessive amount of these medications more than a couple of days per week, you can do harm to your body, you can make your headaches worse, go see a neurologist, uh, there, you know, there's a lot we can do for these patients. So we start with lifestyle modification, try to identify if there's something that's triggering it in your diet, get enough sleep, get enough exercise, uh, general um, um, great recommendations, move on to some mild over-the-counters if possible. But if they're not really working within a time frame, make sure you get checked out by an neurologist. Yes, exactly. Great, fantastic. Well, thanks again, Brad. This is, this is most helpful. I always like when I have podcast guests that I learn from as well. Um, to our listeners, uh, again, hopefully you find this as a good resource. Um, as usual, uh, any ideas or thoughts for future topics, um, please feel free to email us at baptisthealthtalk at baptisthealth.net and uh, stay safe. Find additional valuable health and wellness information on our resource blog at baptisthealth.net slash news. And be sure to interact with us on our social media channels for live and upcoming events. This podcast is brought to you by Baptist Health South Florida, healthcare that cares.